The 2000s were a turbulent time for the Walt Disney Animation Studio. The Disney Renaissance had come to an end, and audiences began to grow tired of the fairy tale musicals that dominated the 90s. The Disney post Renaissance era, sometimes called the experimental era, saw the studio experiment with a number of different genres in the changing animation industry. The movies of this era ranged from buddy comedies to science fiction and everything in between. This would be the last time the studio would emphasize hand drawn animation, and the first that the studio would release CGI features. It was also the era where Disney had to reinvent itself to keep up with competition from Pixar and DreamWorks. But which of these movies are worth revisiting, and which are we better off pretending like they didn't happen? Hey guys, I'm Brad with Wicked Binge, and this is the Disney post-Renaissance era, worst to best. For this list, we'll be starting off with the worst films and working our way up to the best. Here we go! Earning the title of Worst Movie, we have Dinosaur. Released in 2000, this was actually Disney's first computer animated movie. It tells the story of an iguanodon named Aladar, who ends up on an island of lemurs as an egg. One lemur, Cleo raises him as her son, and he grows up among the family. Years later, a meteor destroys the island, forcing them to find a new home. Aldar begins to reconnect with this kind along the perilous journey, and the group runs into the evil Carnotaurus. Dinosaur received praise during its initial run, primarily regarding its animation, but it seems to have been forgotten since then. There's a good reason for this. Simply put, this movie is boring. Nearly the whole movie is made up of the cast walking from place to place. If a predator catches you, you're on your own. That's not horrible, as lots of movies could be summarized this way, but the problem is in the execution. Any other movie would use this simple plot as a backdrop for interesting character conflicts. Instead, the cast in this movie is as paper thin as the story being told. They're all archetypes we've seen in Disney movies dozens of times. For example, Aladar is the easygoing and heroic protagonist we've seen in, like, every Disney film. Beyond that, there isn't much to this character besides, well, being a dinosaur. Everyone else's characterization is the same, which leads to a forgettable set of characters. Even the CGI, the movie's saving grace for many critics, hasn't aged well. The film looks ugly, and it's not just because of the CGI. The color palette is dull, unless you really enjoy the color gray. The lack of color almost makes you want to put on any other Disney movie. At least you'll be looking at something nice. Dinosaur's biggest sin is that it's unremarkable. It's bad, but there isn't anything about it that's even interesting. This is far from the only bad movie on the list, but at least those are interesting in their awfulness. This film just… exists, which is about the nicest thing we can say about it. If you're in the mood for an animated film revolving around dinosaurs, check out The Land Before Time. Leave these dinosaurs to the meteor. Next, we have 2004's Home on the Range. The film is set in the Old West and revolves around three cows, the show cow Maggie, the optimistic Grace, and the proper Mrs. Calloway. Their farm is about to enter foreclosure, but the trio comes up with a plan to prevent this. They plan to capture the cattle rustler Amelda Slim for his bounty and use the money for the farm. During their adventure, they make new friends, bond with these friends, and make some new enemies. Home on the Range isn't a good movie, but it does have memorable moments, something that you can't say for Dinosaur. Amelda Slim's villain song is decent, and the sequence is the standout moment. It's lively and colorful in a way no other scene in the movie is. The idea of an animated western is welcomed, and it gives the film a unique feel from the other entries in the Disney canon. Unfortunately, the negatives outweigh the positives. Once again, we have a movie with forgettable characters. Even though all the cows are distinct from each other, you'll barely remember their names. Slim is one of the weaker Disney villains, even with a catchy song. The storyline is nothing special. The film tries to get you to care about the farm foreclosing, but the film has barely begun when this plotline is introduced. Wouldn't it have made more sense for us to get to know this farm and its inhabitants and then have the farm foreclosed? We ultimately don't form any meaningful attachment to the farm or the characters. There isn't much in the way of stakes, which almost makes it feel like the direct-to-DVD sequel to a movie that never happened. While nice to look at, even the animation looks considerably worse than their prior efforts in the decade. This is baffling since it's actually the fourth most expensive 2D animated feature ever made. We are not joking. Home on the Range isn't a movie focused on story or characters, but comedy. This wouldn't be a problem if the humor wasn't so poor, as 99% of the comedy is just slapstick, and it gets old fast. There isn't a single joke that lands. 
you won't be quoting this movie like you would others on this list. Home on the Range is a mess. I gave up clown college for this? A mess that, might we add, practically killed Disney's interest in hand-drawn animation. While Disney dipped their toes back into the second dimension after this, it was a film that convinced Disney that people no longer cared about these films, and that is reason enough for it to be so low. This is another one to skip, but we'll take this over Dinosaur. Next, we have Chicken Little. The follow-up to Home on the Range, Chicken Little tells the tale of the title character. Chicken Little is a child who becomes a town's laughingstock when he believes the sky is falling. Crazy little chicken, you're so smart, we don't make eye contact, bye-bye! He attempts to fix his relationship with the townspeople and his father by becoming a baseball player. Things look good for Chicken Little, until he learns more about the piece of the sky that hit him. He finds a UFO and a lost alien child named Kirby. We're gonna do whatever it takes to get you back home, okay? The aliens soon invade Earth to take back the child, and Chicken Little must protect the town from the invaders. The first feature Disney released after abandoning 2D animation, Chicken Little is far from their greatest 3D outing. At the very least, it's an improvement of the two previous entries. There are some memorable characters, although some may be memorable for reasons that creators didn't intend. Chicken Little is an alright protagonist, he's an underdog, and you want to see him succeed. The side characters are one note, but they do have their moments. The pig, runt on the litter, in particular, has some funny lines. There is some good comedy in this movie, which should be expected when it's directed by the same mind who brought us The Emperor's New Groove. Despite that, this film is another hot mess. Chicken Little feels like a movie at war with itself. The first half of the movie focuses on Chicken Little and his relationship with his father, eventually culminating in his tenure as a baseball player. After his victory, the film does a 180 and becomes an alien invasion film. It's jarring, and there's not much in the way of setup for the alien plotline. Having two different stories is already weird, but what's worse is that the film fails to do either of them justice. A Disney movie about either a father-son relationship or an alien invasion could have been really interesting and completely new territory for the studio. Sadly, that's not what we got. It only feels like these storylines were chosen as a poor attempt to recapture the magic of Lilo and Stitch, which also focused on a family with an alien plotline sprinkled in, but to much greater success. The film's biggest issue, however, is the supporting cast. They're mean-spirited, to the point where it doesn't even feel like a Disney movie. You can make a movie with jerk characters, and you'll see a movie that did that to great effect later on in this list. However, this film fails to make them compelling. Chicken Little's father seems nasty. Even when he has a change of heart, you never warm to him. Overall, Chicken Little is what you get when a studio loses faith in its own movies and tries to imitate its competitors. It's a Disney movie that doesn't feel like a Disney movie, and that's why it's this low on the list. From one talking animal movie to another, we have 2008's Bolt. The movie follows a pet dog of the same name. He's the star of a popular TV series where he fights crime alongside his owner, Penny. He's lived his entire life on the show's set, and the creators have gone to great lengths to keep him immersed in the show's universe. This causes him to really believe he is a superhero. After filming an episode where Penny's kidnapped, he goes on a dangerous journey to find her. He makes friends with the alley cat Mittens and the hamster Rhino. He also learns that there's more to him than being a superhero on a TV show. In a nutshell, Bolt is the Truman Show mixed with Buzz Lightyear's arc from the first Toy Story. It's nowhere near as good as those two, but it's not as bad as the previous entries. Bolt isn't a bad movie, it's just not great either. It's more lukewarm than anything else. There are some fun elements in this movie. The characters aren't the best to come out of a Disney movie, but they are entertaining. Bolt is a compelling enough character to be the center of a movie, although the casting of John Travolta has us scratching our heads. I'll never let them get you, Penny. He's good, but you would have thought they'd pick a younger star. The hamster Rhino is also a fun source of comedic relief, and you can see why he ended up getting a short film. This is also the best looking of Disney CGI features in this decade. It's definitely not up to par with their more recent output. It still feels like it's transitioning from the quality of early 3D films to future movies like Tangled and Frozen. Besides those highlights, the movie's fine, but not anything more than that. The story's fine, the writing's fine, it's all just fine. Just a perfectly standard Disney movie. Probably the biggest issue with the movie isn't even the movie itself, 
but the movie we missed out on. Originally, this film was titled American Dog and would have been directed by Chris Sanders, one of the co-directors for Lilo and Stitch. The film had the same plotline as the finished movie, but with all the quirkiness and heart that the movie mentioned earlier had, at least according to those who saw the footage of the project. Sanders eventually left the project over creative differences, and we got Bolt instead. With how fine Bolt is, it's hard not to think about what could have been. If you prefer your canines to be super, this might be a movie for you. If not, you might be better off with some of Disney's other dog-centric pictures. Our next entry goes to 2003's Brother Bear. Brother Bear is set in Alaska and focuses on three brothers who are members of a tribe. The tribesmen are given totems, which tell them what they must achieve to become men. The youngest brother, Kenai, receives the bear of love much to his disappointment. Later, the oldest brother, Sitka, is killed by a bear. Kenai slays the bear in the act of revenge, which prompts the spirits to transform him into a bear for punishment. After entering his new body, he befriends a young cub named Koda. The two begin to trail towards the mountains, as will make Kenai human again. They must also avoid the middle brother, Denahai, who believes the bear also killed Kenai and fails to realize they are the same. Brother Bear has a lot of good and some bad. Let's start with the bad. First, the comedy never really lands. Although they have some funny moments, there are these Moose Brothers who are annoying. Anytime the movie trails off to them, you just want them to get back to the plot. The Phil Collins soundtrack is also disappointing. This is no Tarzan, that's for sure. It's also not a movie that takes a lot of risk. You know everything that's gonna happen, and it can make the movie a cliché. Despite this, there is plenty to enjoy. While the execution could have been better, the focus on brothers is refreshing. We don't see that connection focus in Disney movies. The setting is also a breath of fresh air, and it brings with it a beautiful-looking movie. Brother Bear is gorgeous to look at, and you can practically feel the warmth or cold of every environment. The backgrounds feel natural, almost as if you can jump into them. There's a lot of heart. The story is serious and emotional, which makes the comedic elements in the movie worse. You're left wanting the movie to get back to the actual drama whenever they happen. It's the most substantial part of the movie. Although you kind of know where it's going, you're still invested in the drama. Brother Bear has seemingly been forgotten to time, and we don't think that's fair. If you're a Disney fan who hasn't seen this movie, it might be time to change that. This one may just surprise you. Next is Fantasia 2000. A sequel around 60 years in the making, Fantasia 2000 follows the format of the original Fantasia and consists of various animated segments set to classical music pieces. Fantasia 2000 is an entertaining follow-up to the original classic, but it can also be frustrating. It has all the potential to be as spectacular as the first, but it falls short. This film has as many segments as the original did, but there aren't nearly as many that will stick with you in the same way like Night on Bald Mountain will. The movie is only half the length of the original, making you think there's a missing part of this movie. You're left wanting more, as if the movie had just started. Despite those issues, this film is still an entertaining oddity in the Disney canon. The two standout segments are definitely Rhapsody in Blue and Firebird Suite. The art styles chosen for these portions are fresh and unique, and the animation itself is breathtaking. The music syncs well with what is occurring on screen, and you perfectly get the emotion of the scene from the music alone. Both shorts are great examples of how music and visuals alone can tell a story, which is what Fantasia is all about. The other shorts are fun, but they don't match the shorts in the previous film in the epic category. We aren't kidding when we say one segment is just about a flamingo with a yo-yo. It's a harmless short, but it's not what you think when you hear Fantasia. When we think of the original movie, we think of its grandness and how different it was from your standard Disney fare. The shorts are all enjoyable, but they lack those qualities. They almost feel like shorts that would have played in front of a Disney or Pixar movie. Despite that, this film is a satisfying watch for any fan of the original. We also have to give the film points for being experimental. This wasn't a movie made to sell toys or bank off of an existing property, but a true labor of love for the original Fantasia. It's the type of movie we probably wouldn't see the Disney of today make, and maybe they won't try this movie again. Bottom line, if you love animation or classical music, this might be the movie for you. This next entry takes us all the way to the stars. It's none other than 2002's Treasure Planet. A science fiction retelling of the adventure novel Treasure Island, Treasure Planet focuses on the troublemaking Jim Hawkins, who is fascinated by the tale of the mysterious Treasure Planet. One day, Jim is given a sphere by a dying spaceship pilot. The sphere contains a map leading to Treasure Planet. 
So, Jim goes on a large-scale voyage to the destination. Along the way, Jim makes some new friends and must avoid a band of pirates determined to get to the planet first, the most expensive traditionally animated movie ever made. Treasure Planet was the passion project of John Musker and Ron Clements. The duo behind Aladdin and The Little Mermaid spent the better part of two decades working to bring this film to life. Sadly, general audiences didn't seem as interested. Treasure Planet became one of the biggest box office flops ever, killing a planned sequel in the process. It's a shame, as Treasure Planet is pretty good. While it doesn't match some of Musker and Clements' other entries in the Disney canon, it can't be denied that this film has all the heart and spirit that those movies do. It has all the fun and adventure you'd want out of a pirate movie. Don't get me started on pirates! I don't like them! It sometimes even feels like the precursor to the Pirates of the Caribbean film series. The film looks stunning, especially during the scenes set in outer space. It's without a doubt one of the best-looking films of this era. The film mixes traditional animation with 3D, and it never feels jarring, even nearly 20 years later. We love how long John Silver's robotic arm is a 3D prop. It blends well with his traditionally animated body. You can't help but think about how they even pulled this off. We also enjoy the blending of a traditional pirate story against a sci-fi backdrop. The sci-fi elements are what really gives this movie a personality. It's even weird to think this is one of the few Disney animated movies you can even classify as part of that genre. The cast of characters is also likable. Jim Hawkins isn't the greatest Disney protagonist, but he's likable in the same way someone like Aladdin is. All the alien characters are fun, and you can tell the character designers had a field day coming up with all kinds of weird alien designs. However, we do take issue with Ben, a robot who befriends Jim. He's like C-3PO, but somehow more annoying. You let me know when I'm rambling. All the characters ultimately pale in comparison to John Silver, the film's villain. We say villain loosely because he can't even really be called one. He's definitely the antagonist, but he also develops a father-like relationship with Jim. In fact, John Silver is often conflicted with his feelings about Jim. He stands in the way of the treasure, but he also cares for him. He's one of the more fascinating and unique Disney villains and an underrated one for sure. It's disappointing to know the story never continued, as it would have been interesting to see his character further develop. Overall, Treasure Planet might not have lit the box office on fire, but there's enough adventure and swashbuckling fun to be had in this film to give it a look. If you love the directing duo's other entries in the Disney canon, then you'll probably love this one. We're traveling to the year 2037 with our next entry, 2007's Meet the Robinsons. The first film released after Disney's buyout of Pixar tells the story of a 12-year-old named Lewis who lives in an orphanage. Lewis is an inventor developing a memory scanner that will help him determine the identity of his mother. The scanner falls apart at the science fair, leading Lewis to meet Wilbur Robinson, a boy who has traveled to the past to retrieve a missing time machine from the evil bowler hat guy. The two visit the future and work together to get the machine back and stop the timeline from being altered. Meet the Robinsons ranks so high for us because it's a film with a big heart. The film's director, Steven Anderson, was actually an orphan, so you get the sense throughout the movie that this is very important to him. The characters are all lovable and fun. Lewis and Wilbur are a good pair of protagonists. You really get convinced about the way their relationship evolves over the course of the movie. The actual Robinsons are a lot of fun too. One of the few gripes we have with the movie is that you don't get that much time to explore them. How sweetie. You almost want some sort of animated series to follow because they all stand out and feel like they could be interesting as individuals. The highlight in the film is definitely Goob, Lewis's roommate. If you ask anybody what they remember from this movie, there's a good chance it'll be a moment involving him. He's a ton of fun, as is the bowler hat guy. What we believe makes Meet the Robinsons so great is its message. The film repeatedly mentions keep moving forward, a phrase attributed to Walt Disney himself. It's heartwarming, and it makes the movie the perfect watch for when the going gets tough. It's also a perfect summary of Disney's output in this decade. When things didn't work out, they kept moving forward, trying to make the next movie better than the last. Meet the Robinsons isn't the best movie of this era. Its fast-paced nature will undoubtedly alienate some viewers. But it's a comforting movie. With a great message and heartwarming characters, Meet the Robinsons is certainly one of the more enjoyable films to come out of the post-Renaissance period. Oh, and word of advice for anyone who decides to watch this one, try not to think too hard about the time travel. 
Now we're going underwater. Earning the bronze trophy is Atlantis The Lost Empire. It is the third and final Disney movie from Beauty and the Beast directors Gary Trousdale and Kirk Weiss. Atlantis follows the linguist Milo Thatch, who discovers a map of the lost city of Atlantis in a journal. He soon meets the millionaire Preston Whitmore, who asks him to join a large-scale expedition to Atlantis. He accepts the offer, thus beginning the treacherous journey to discover this lost civilization. Upon its release, Disney expected big things from Atlantis. Plans were underway for sequels, theme park attractions, and even a TV series. Unfortunately, the film brought in a lukewarm box office, and Disney canceled all plans related to the movie. In the years since its release, however, the film has become something of a cult classic. It's easy to see why, as Atlantis is easily one of the best movies to come out of this era. The film has great art direction, which was heavily influenced by Hellboy artist Mike Mignola. The comic book art style makes the film stand out in the pantheon of Disney's hand-drawn movies, and the animation is equally stunning. Atlantis in particular is a wonderfully realized location. The world of Atlantis in general is one of the best aspects of the movie. The world building is off the charts, with the crew going as far as developing a complete language for the Atlantean people. It makes you wish Disney had created an Atlantis-themed area in the parks. The characters are also great. Milo is a unique protagonist. He's more book-smart and shrimpy than other heroes, and the performance by Michael J. Fox is also great. Legend has it that your people possess a power source of some kind. Really though, it's the side characters who steal the show. Atlantis probably has the best supporting cast of any Disney movie, and it's not surprising that they consider making a show with them. All of them have their moments, but none more than Vinny, the demolitions expert. He has plenty of memorable lines and is the main source of comedic relief. However, this would all be meaningless if the film failed to deliver on the sense of adventure. Thankfully, this movie does not run into this problem. Every action set piece is exciting, from the Leviathan attack to the final battle. This is by no means a perfect movie. The villain is your typical bad guy motivated by money. The film also suffers from a short runtime, leaving you to wonder how much better the movie could have been if its stories had been given more time to breathe. Thanks anyway, but uh, I think we're good. Nevertheless, Atlantis is one of the best movies of the post-Renaissance era and a forgotten classic in the Disney animated canon. If you have a hankering for an Indiana Jones-styled animated movie, then this one's for you. Leaping from one empire to another, we give the silver trophy to 2000's The Emperor's New Groove. The film tells the story of an Incan emperor named Cusco, who is as egotistical as they come. He looks to develop a summer home called Cusco-topia by raising a village, which prompts the villager Pacha to discuss the issue with him. Cusco also lets go of his advisor Yzma, who begins plotting to kill him and take over the throne. Things take a turn when Yzma's assistant, Kronk, gives him a potion that turns him into a llama instead of killing him. Take him out of town and finish the job now! Kronk disposes of Cusco, who reunites with Pacha. The two begin to work together to turn Cusco back into a human, and a friendship slowly starts between the duo. When it comes to Disney movies that had a rocky production, this film easily takes the cake. Conceived under the title, Kingdom of the Sun, the film was intended to be a musical epic similar to The Lion King. In fact, both films originally shared the same director, Roger Allers. After poor test screenings, Disney put in Mark Dindal as co-director, who aimed to give the film more comedic elements. Roger Allers was not pleased with this and left the project, giving us the movie we know today. While it's hard not to think about what could have been, the movie we got is undeniably fantastic. The Emperor's New Groove is just as much a classic as the Disney Renaissance films that preceded it. All the characters are enjoyable and insanely quotable. Cusco is a humongous jerk, but you love him regardless. He's another unique lead in the world of Disney movies, and the relationship he develops with Pacha is fun to watch. They go from being at each other's throats to the best of friends, and it flows well. Yzma is an underrated villain, and Eartha Kitt has the time of her life in the role. Patrick Warburton is legendary as Kronk, who probably has the best lines out of anyone. Squeaky, uh, squeak, squeaker. He's easily the most entertaining out of the many Disney villain sidekicks. Besides the characters, the humor is also solid. There are tons of memorable lines and moments that are still funny, even over 20 years later. It's not hard to see why this film has been the source for so many memes, as it is genuinely funny. The Emperor's New Groove, like our previous entry, did not perform well when it was released in theaters. 
However, time has been on the movie's side, as it has become one of the most popular films of this era. With that, and a hilarious set of characters, it only makes sense that this movie gets second place. The gold medal goes to Lilo and Stitch. Let's be real, what else could it have been? Released in 2002, Lilo and Stitch follows Lilo, a chaotic little girl who lives with her older sister after the tragic deaths of their parents. It also tells the story of Experiment 626, or Stitch, a genetic experiment made to cause destruction. He escapes to the planet Earth and becomes Lilo's pet, Dog. While the two have formed a bond, the Galactic Federation sends a pair of aliens to retrieve Stitch. Lilo and Stitch was by far the most successful Disney film of this era, spawning an animated series, a theme park attraction, several sequels, and even an anime. It makes sense, as the film is easily the best of this whole lot. Lilo and Stitch is the perfect comfort movie. This film has everything you want in an animated film, but it never feels generic. It has all the heart, warmth, and fun of the best animated features, and keeps true to the directing duo's vision while doing so. The film has an assortment of colorful characters who are all compelling in their own ways. From the social worker, Cobra Bubbles, to the aliens, Pleakley and Jumba, no two characters feel the same. Each character has at least one great moment or quote, giving the movie a highly memorable supporting cast. Even with the fun side cast, the movie never loses its focus on Lilo, her sister Nani, and Stitch. The relationship between these three is the movie's real heart, and is primarily what makes the film so great. The interactions between Lilo and Nani feel real, and any pair of siblings can relate to them. It's also very refreshing to see an animated film focused on a set of sisters, which we don't see a lot of. Don't worry, you're nice, and someone will give you a job. Stitch is fun and lovable, but what we really love about him is how he acts like a mirror of Lilo. Both of them felt lost and out of their environments. It makes their friendship feel more human, even though he's this weird alien experiment. This movie legitimately does more with its characters than most Disney movies even try to. Besides the great character work, there are still other amazing things to talk about. The Hawaiian setting is lovely, and the use of watercolors makes for a beautiful animated feature. The Elvis soundtrack also goes a long way in giving the film its unique identity. In general, the film has a vibe and feel that is totally its own. Disney has made plenty of comedies, musicals, and fairy tales, but there is only one Lilo and Stitch. What else can we say that hasn't been said? Lilo and Stitch is by far the best movie of the post-Renaissance period, and it's absolutely worth the watch. It's on Disney Plus right now. What are you waiting for? All right, guys, that's the list. Let us know in the comments section. Do you agree with our ranking? Which Disney post-Renaissance movie do you love the most? And tell us what we should cover next. Remember to hit that notification bell and binge more of our videos. But most importantly, stay wicked.